Hello, um, welcome to everybody to this discussion of uh, Vygotsky, Education and Revolution, which um, is a discussion around a new book which B Bookmarks is about to publish by um, Shirley Franklin. Um, my name's Jane Bassett. I'm a, um, a just about retired teacher actually in Hackney and also a member of Hackney National Education Union where I'm an officer. Um, and I'm, go I'm going to interview Shirley and chair this uh, discussion. Um, couple of things to say before I do that. I mean, Shirley and I have known each other for a very long time. I think it's 35, almost 36 years. She was the NUT rep in my very first school um, back in 1985, I think it was. Um, she, but also she and I both, um, a couple of years apart, did uh, an MA at the Institute of Education, um, brilliant MA on language, literature and um, and education, English teaching, in which we both had the opportunity to read um, Vygotsky and various other um, cultural theories, such as Voloshinov, for example. And I think we've both had a sort of ongoing love, both love of Vygotsky and, and as well as a sort of um, dialogue, if you like, about um, what he means and um, why he's so important. So I think this, this publication, this new book, is a fantastic opportunity to think about his ideas and what they tell us about really what's wrong with the education system today. Um, just before I hand over to Shirley, I uh, just wanted to say one other thing, which is um, I've discussed Bogotsky, as I said, a lot with Shirley and with other people in various forums. I think one of those people actually is um, was actually at um, uh, with Honey Rosenberg, who many people on this call will know um, died earlier on this week. But you know, I think um, I'd like to pay tribute to her, both because I was involved in discussions sitting at their house uh, with various other people around this sort of cultural um, heritage of the Russian Revolution. And also actually because Honey was a teacher and she was a teacher in Hackney and someone who I think was very much in tune with the kind of Vygotsky's approach to education and the way he put children's learning and all children, I think, at the centre of it. So, um, and I thought it was appropriate to um, pay a tribute to Honey, given the circumstances this week. So at which point I'm going to hand over to Shirley. And I'm just going to ask Shirley really to start off with by saying, you know, Vygotsky was working in the 1920s. Um, he died in 1934. Um, but we're still talking about him um, almost 100 years later and still thinking about why he's so relevant. What is so important and so exciting about Vygotsky and his ideas? Hi, Jane. Um, well, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, he, he died in, um, in uh, 1934. Um, and uh, at, the, at a very young age, I have to say. Um, but in, for a long time after his death, nobody knew anything about his ideas because mm. it, this was in Stalin's Russia. And uh, as, far as, um, as far as Stalin was concerned, he was far too um, uh, it, concerned about the, the development of the individual, far too concerned about um, matching theory with practice in terms of the, of, 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 of the individual. But also his work did actually go to America, but that was stopped as well because it was seen to be too, you know, too, too lefty, too, too, um, too associated with, with communism. So it's only it's really since the 60s, I would say, that, that his ideas have begun to develop. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, they started to develop along with Plowden when people were talking about um, you know, um, child-centered learning and things like that. I think they actually got Vygotsky wrong in those days, but they were talking about child-centered learning. I mean, it was great that it was a breakaway. And we, now we have, we're in the situation of a government that really doesn't seem to understand what learning is all about and, and what learning and development are all about, actually. They seem to cons and think that children are empty sort of vessels and that you, you say something, you know, churn in the knowledge, Knowledge equals learning. Turn it in, and they'll they'll learn it. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. And actually, Vygotsky's. If you, if you have an understanding of, Vygotsk, of what Vygotsky is saying about how children learn, it absolutely shows that's complete and utter nonsense. That our learning and our development it very much relates to our social experiences. Um, it relates to the culture that we've grown up in, our own histories, and. It, well, Vygotsky was com completely committed to developing a, a Marxist, materialist um, mm. understanding of how we learn and develop and think. Actually, it's not just about education, how we 
act and do and behave and are. And um, and the materialist one, um, um, understanding do, is one that relates it to our histories and one that relates it to our social social environment. So I think now more than ever, we need to bring that back. We need to say, look, we can have stim Vygotsky also used to talk about the importance of stimulation, of stimulating motivational learning and how important that was. My God, if you want to do what the government want to do, fact, fact, you know, grad grind stuff, it's not exactly motivational and it's not really going to develop learners. Uh, sorry, I'm going to rant on. <laughs> the other thing <laughs> that, yeah. that makes me rant is this levels thing. Oh my goodness, children, you know, after COVID, they, all their levels of, of um, they haven't progressed through the levels. And that's not what learning is about, is it? I mean, if they really were concerned about children and their education, first of all, they'd, they'd ensure that they had computers, that they weren't living in poverty and that their conditions in which they lived were, were not as... Um, awful as they are under this sort of government um so that's number one but and then they can, you can do stimulating um collaborative learning because that's what Vygotsky was also into collaborative collaborative learning he was um one of the things that interests me about him was I mean I'm a Jew and he was a Jew and he um was um grew up in in Russia and suffered under the pogroms and from um at uh, the end of the um, 19th century. And um, one of the things that the Jews do is, is they study the Talmud or they study, do their homework together in pairs, you know, with learning partners is what we call call, call it now. Yeah. But uh, actually what Jews call it is, and I didn't really realise all this until I worked in the Jewish environment, is, is you have a chavroza, you, you have somebody that you study the law with Mm -hmm. And I think that had a quite a significant impact in terms of what Vygotsky was talking about, because collaboration is key to um, his ideas about how children learn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that whole idea of dialogue is absolutely central to Vygotsky's mm -hmm. idea of learning, isn't it? It's the idea that you don't, as you said, test children on one day on a on an isolated test, but you actually you actually both they learn together and they share together and that you know which is a uh, then it's a social approach to education that absolutely depends on dialogue which i suppose leads me straight on very conveniently in fact to one of vygotsky's most famous concepts which is the zone of proximal development which is very much about collaboration but can you explain why it's so important and but also the some of some of the pitfalls associated with its use or some people's ideas about it so I think the most important thing about the zone of proximal development is a, it's a concept that, again, is a social theory of learning. Is it's, it's, you don't learn on your own; you learn best with in collaboration or cooperation, as he called it, with a more capable peer. So, what he was talking about is he's it's just this wonderful optimistic theory of learning that we shouldn't pitch teaching or or even working with people who have difficult, uh, if we want somebody to learn something, learn a skill or whatever it is, we shouldn't pitch it at the level at which they're at, but we should pitch it at a level at which they're capable. It's that kind of, it would, within their potential. And that it's about a potential. That, and it, in fact, this notion of potential feeds through, I think, a lot of his ideas. In, in, um, but this, that's what the zone of proximal development is, is about working within the potential. If you work outside the potential, it's, it's it, the, the, zone, the zone, it's not going to work. If you, if you work down there, it's, it's useless. It's why, he, incidentally, he said that tests were absolutely pointless. Because he said tests, actually tests, uh, um, exams, test where, where children are at now. It doesn't show what they're capable of doing with the help of a more capable peer. And I always think about my children uh, in the good old days of mixed ability teaching, when they used to sit, you know, in mixed ability groups and work with um, other kids. And so they, what th that format actually helps. It facilitates the development of, of kids being able to reach into their own potential because it's collaborative learning. It's got the more, the Kids who've learned have to do this complicated thing of simplifying whatever it is that the, the lesson's about. And the other ones are having the discussion. And that is that discussion that's um, this interaction between people that becomes interaction. It goes inside 
So, and that's what's really interesting about, about the theory. I, th I think that kind of notion of intraaction, interaction becoming intraaction inside your head, but using the, the the kind of frames or the language or whatever it is that of the person that you're with. So you and I are having a conversation. And mm -hmm. so we'll bounce off it. We won't just bounce off each other. We'll use, if it's working well, we'll use what one, one person's saying and incorporate it into our thinking and develop, we'll, we'll go forward. Yeah. And of course, the the person you're working with could be another adult it could be other students but and i think one mm. argument that's often okay. put in is is that you know um uh, bright i use the word advisedly bright students are held back by this and i think it's quite important isn't it that they're not simply because um because actually that whole process of having not only to understand something but to then to render it to somebody else is actually in itself it, you're actually internalizing your own learning and extending it and i think i think that idea of potential and creativity is very very important um okay i mean that's uh, can i just add by the way we are putting up um just, uh, requests for questions so do feel that you can actually ask a question or put in a comment somebody's put in some really useful um links there but you know we'd love to hear from the audience as well um in terms of that potential and in terms of if you like that idea of creativity in education something which is so lacking at the moment why is that idea of imagination and creativity so important to Vygotsky well um, <laughs> Vygotsky wrote the most amazing article that you and I didn't see. Well, I don't know if you saw it, but I didn't see it on the course that we went on. Yeah, and I've only yeah. come across it quite recently in, in, in sort of while writing the book. And it's ab about play and imagination. I mean, there's, there's an article, article on play, but this one on um, play and creativity is just amazing. Um, and he talks about, well, first of all, the, the various sorts of play can actually develop language skills and mm -hmm. and also you in in the course of play you learn you learn how to interact with somebody else you create your own rules and all that all that in imagination right and it's mm -hmm. it, it takes you onwards so it isn't just in the field of creative story writing or something like that you can think about this right the way across the curriculum so he talks about in that article about how um creativity enables you to go it's again it's like the the zone of proximal development of going beyond where you currently uh, are at although you have to have that wealth of experiences to draw on in order to be able to to use to to, to go further in to create the new concepts that, that that you're working on so it's important because it makes for i mean and he writes about that about how he wants to see a russia that's that's full of, of young people who have this creativity and imagination because that, they'll be able to solve the problems, technical yeah. problems. I mean, you, you know, if you think about technology, you need to be highly creative in terms of, in the broadest sense of the term. And that's what he was writing about. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that thing around the, the situation he was writing out in Russia in the in the 1920s was in many ways a very backward place, wasn't it? There's, uh, you know, there was a huge effort by the Soviet government to, to up to start education to upgrade culture if you like but at the same time there was massive poverty you'd had the, the effects of the civil war mm. and so on and so forth and um I, th I think Vygotsky's whole commitment to that is really important in terms of why he you know he wanted people to have wider horizons didn't he to sort of develop themselves and go beyond that yeah and it, through a kind of they had a sort of equivalent of a scout movement and he was quite in, interested in developing all these different schemes that that student that young people would expand their horizons yeah yeah, yeah. exactly mm. um and also i mean i was just thinking a bit more about play and um oh, I, sorry, yes. I, yeah no no don't worry i'm um I'm, i mean i'm a set like you i'm a secondary teacher but i mean i think play is incredibly important in 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 the early years in education in primary education yet it's something that's constantly being downplayed by government you know with Again, it goes back to this idea of baseline testing, for example, uh, but also the idea that what children need is to be t having formal education rather than play. And, you know, why Why exactly is play so important? So. Well, it's, it's important in just so many different ways. It's important in terms of... I mean, one of the things I always remember is... Um, I've said, I've said it to you before, is um, my youngest son used to line his cars up and uh, and 
have a, but I don't really understand what the rules were, but he, he'd line them up and then they'd move them move across the floor and and he'd talk endlessly about what he was mm -hmm. doing. So what in what um, thinking aloud is what uh, verbal speech, uh, verbal thinking, and. And so it's important so, and it created the opportunities for that and that creates the opportunities for thought and it creates the opportunities for developing language it creates what well, it does it creates new situations and that's yeah. that's incredibly important yeah but there's i mean there's lots and lots of different situations that that uh you know you can say that the play is important but but uh for vygotsky it's it's about developing concepts i mean one of the things about vygotsky as i was saying before he died at quite a young age so a lot of what he was saying is, is quite in a sense it's not restricted because it's extraordinarily broad and varied but um um he, he could have gone a lot further we can all go further with it yeah. And of course, the other thing about play is stu um, children are using their imagination, but they're also having to generate rules, aren't they? And I think that's quite important in terms of they begin to understand sort of the ba the boundaries, if you like, of what is and isn't possible. And I think that that whole idea that they're learning, learning that kind of uh, way of disciplining their own thoughts rather than having it imposed is really quite important so yeah they learn the, they learn rules they under but they also understand the way people relate to each other that's something else that he was talking about you know how um, how a, a parent relates to a child it, you know, it comes up when you're uh, uh, mothers and children all that sort of activity or if you're doctors or whatever it is um all the games that young children play it, it's a, a it's a development of understanding how people relate to each other that, mm. and, and that's you know it's about it's it's not just about kind of um heavy learning it's about how the world works and that sort of you know which yeah. develops the, the, the person yeah and and of course develops social interaction doesn't it in in the sort of most positive sense of actually learning to work with other people yeah absolutely. and collaborate with them so um i've got some other uh, questions but i've also got one from the chat um mm which is basically, given the reactionary ideas dominating education policy today, do you think there is space for teachers to implement Vygotsky's ideas in their teaching and how can they do that? Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There's always space, I think, to, to, um, to, to be a bit more progressive than, than what they want you to be. I have to say that I'm not a practicing teacher anymore. I'm, thank God, retired from the classroom. But, <laughs> it, the thing to, I think, the bottom line, I think, it's, it, the thing to understand is the importance of learning being motivational and the importance of engagement and the importance of talk. Now, he wasn't just into talk for talk's sake, that you just let kids talk, let kids play. And because I, I think that's what people thought in the 60s. Um, he was he was quite clear about different sorts of learning and he believed in more formal education. So yes, you can have more formal, but it needs to be quite structured. And within that formal setup, you allow for talk, and that's Vygotskyan. And I also think looking at he was we haven't really talked about concepts and language. No, I'm just going to go on to that in a second. The, yeah. If, if, if we think about that, um, he talks about how there's every day you, know, you pick up your language every day, but actually different people with different sorts of um, experiences, backgrounds, or whatever you want to call it, pick up. Um, different breadth of um, language and what he also says is, he, is language is a tool for thinking so if you've got a narrow narrower experience of an, a narrower vocabulary if you like you're going to have less tools for, for using for uh, language as a tool for thought so you have less of those tools for thought but he, what he did was he distinguished between um, what he called academic uh, concepts, the sort of uh, concepts that we use in education, or um, not every day, you know, and um, and uh, the playground, if you like, or home. Um, mm -hmm. And he was saying, actually, the importance about um, what uh, some academic concepts is that they have to be taught. They have to be taught formally, as because as what he said is they're learnt downwards, so they're taught from above whereas the other mm -hmm. whereas everyday concepts are, are learned through experience but you don't you, you're not going to learn those scientific concepts of everydayness i mean i certainly know i felt that i was 
spent ages trying to do a PhD, which I think was the most alien thing I could ever have done. And it was a highly scientific concept. And I was spent my life asking people what's a, what's a PhD and what's a, what, how does it work? Because I didn't get it because it was such, it, you know, such and and not a, such a scientific not everyday concept to me but it these con concepts are terribly important because they are the building bro blocks of our thought you mm. know and the more complex concepts that we have <clears throat> the more um the more resources we have i was going to show you um the the um the blocks that he used to to talk to talk yeah. about yeah so he he developed he, in fact he didn't develop somebody else developed um uh, um, the use of 24 different blocks. So we've got these blocks that are different colours, different shapes. All right. I'm going to cheat because there we are. There's all these different, different things, right? So mm -hmm. um, what, what he used to, to do was he used to put all 24, I can't, I'm going to try and do it, but I can't do it with uh, the yeah. space that we have, is he put all 22 on the table um, and there's a name on the back, an, a nonsense name on, on, the, on the back, and he, but he, he, they, they couldn't see them. So they put them down on the table and there'd be two children together and he'd say, now sort them. So, so th there were no guidelines at all. So, and then gradually he'd give more and more guidelines, like, for example, um if if they're not so if they've put two together that shouldn't have been together he the, the observer can interact but while they're doing it the the children talk to each other about why they're placing the blocks in in where they're placing them so and that's what is it's, it's called um it, they're verbalizing their inner inner speech if you like so mm -hmm. you, if you listen to the children talking about their rationale for before placing those blocks. You can hear th their thought process. It was like a bit like I was talking about my son organising his cars. Yeah, that, that's what they're doing, and it's a very very interesting exercise because you know as, as a, we used to do it, we did it on our MA course, didn't we, Jane? And you know, there's all different interventions. The um, the names at, at some point you, you explain the names. There's actually just to ruin it for everybody. There's only four categories. That to, but they are complex categories. They're not just one thing. They're not just circle or red. Um, in fact, they're neither circle nor red. Um, mm. uh, they're something else. And But it's a really interesting way of understanding how people learn. But it's also an interesting way of guessing. Of, you could do, you, I'll have to lend them to you, Jane, to do, to do with your granddaughter. Because <laughs> Thank I, you. <laughs> be quite an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, a bit later on when she's able to yeah. Yeah. articulate what she's up to but it's mm -hmm. uh, it's quite a I've quite got a fun. couple of questions here one of which I'll go back to later but one of them is directly relevant to these blocks where can we get hold of them um I don't know I'm presuming well, you in the back of the book you have to buy the book because in the back of the book yeah. I've got all the measurements I had these made when I worked at Middlesex University yeah so you can um, actually get them made, I would imagine, but I have I never have, tried. I you can actually buy them. I, yeah. No, I don't know if you can buy them. I mean, I yeah. I do know. I think they're on like the Americans. God, I mm. mean, they can get kind of snazzy versions of them. But I yeah. think it's quite nice to just have them like this, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, so I I just went to the. Um, you can. I don't know if you can do it these days. Go to your technology department and say that this is what I'd like you to make. And they'd have these long things that were that shape, and they just chop bits yeah. off. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I'm not going to do it. I'm afraid. But um, okay. Um, before I take the other question, I'm just going to go back to your point about um, students need scientific need to be taught, um, yeah. and you know that, and, and there's a whole kind of stream of thinking in government thinking about education that really places knowledge, you know, the teacher as expert up against up against students as empty vessels. But um, but I don't think that's quite what you're saying, is it? The you know, the teacher has got responsibility, if you like, for passing on knowledge, for enabling the development of concepts. Yeah. But it's far more interactive than that, isn't it? So. I think I'm talking in terms of concepts rather than knowledge. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose in a way it processes and, and so to get to kind of and I think if you understand if it's understood about how concepts work, then mm -hmm. there is an understanding of how knowledge takes place, how learning yeah. takes place yeah. actually. Yeah. Um because it is quite interesting. Learning is different from from knowledge. I always used to find it quite interesting that uh, when I was at Middlesex we had to grade our students' work and there was this thing one heading was knowledge and the other was understanding. You just think, well, are these two separate yeah, things? Separate, you know, yeah. just like some, can somebody just quote loads of things? You know, what's yeah. the difference? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Breaking the, um, I'll go back to uh, the other question we've got here at the moment. Um, bearing in mind the period of the 1920s in which um, Vygotsky was developing his ideas, what impact did he have in Russia at the time or were they used later on? So, so what Vygotsky, Vygotsky um, started working in, as a teacher trainer, really, in, in, in the 1920s, uh, mm -hmm. but he started studying um on his own, and he had um, a, a group of people. But in, in 1924, he came over um, as a representative. He started actually. He got really interested in in the field of uh, what they what they call in Russia defectology, which is what we call here special educational needs. Um, and that was his main thing. He was kind of concerned about um, the impacts of of the revolution. I mean, great that the revolution as it was but it did actually a lot of people got uh, there was a lot of poverty and damage and all that sort of stuff so he was was very interested he set up these institutions for the study of defectology and he came over to um a conference that was held at the institute of education i love that since i used to work there and yeah. um but he came over with a rep uh, representing the um Commissariat for education, but the but about the education of deaf deaf children, and that's mm -hmm. what he was interested in. Then his thing about um, deaf, he was very respected actually in terms of the answer to that question. He was a very respected uh, uh, um, educationalist, but he wasn't just an educationalist because he he worked in the field of defectology. He worked in terms of in theory, but he also had a clinic. And it's difficult to know what he did as a clinic because very few of his notes survive. They're, they're in a, a um, there's one or two notes of his in a, a wonderful collection that I'm lucky enough to have of his notebooks. But there's, people don't really talk about his work as a, as a psychologist. Um, but he was at the cutting, he was at the top, if you like, but it was really problematic because of what happened in the 30s with Stalin and they were all broken up because Stalin wanted to separate the kind of th the theoreticians from the practice practitioners. Um, but he he was with the best in, in the Soviet Union. He also had this really interesting um, kind of school that I think is still going, that there was a BBC programme about it recently, about um, working with deaf and mute ch children. And he was very committed to um, providing um, communicative resource for um, for deaf children and for blind children, because he, he knew that once you've got your language, you can form the concepts. You know, the, the, once you once you it's a, so you need to be able to have the language. If you're if you're deaf, you can't hear it. If you're blind, you can't see it. So how important it was to have um, uh, Braille and, um, uh, you know, for, for, for these kids in, in order for them to have access to language and access to development. And sign language, of course, too. Uh, sign, yes, sorry, sign language. You think about how um, in many sort of more traditional institutions at the time, um, children were totally discouraged, weren't they, from using sign language and and um, well, he and, wobbled. He wobbled. Uh, you're right. You're completely yeah. right about that because he wobbled on sign language and then he changed his mind. Yeah. So yes, it's interesting. Yeah. So he learned from experience too. But mm. I think the other thing that going back to that question about what impact did he have at the time? I mean, he certainly did have impact on on people at the time. And he worked with quite famous people, didn't he? People like Luria, who went on to develop yeah. ideas. He probably knew poets like Mayakovsky, who later committed suicide under um, under the impact of Stalinism. So he was sort of around in that milieu, but then he he was very much coming under a cloud, I think, by the early 30s, and as Stalin sort of tightened his grip. Well, he was actually, yeah. it was quite surprising. It's kind of, it's difficult to tell. Some people say he would have been murdered by Stalin um, mm -hmm. if he hadn't died of TB um, when he was 34. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, because, well, 
he did did still manage to work until till his death and then his books were banned actually so then he yeah yeah, yeah his books were yeah banned. but of course the other thing he did during the tw 20s was he actually traveled to various parts of russia particularly i think out to the sort of towards the mm -hmm. east of russia the sort of more if you like backward area so he actually did a lot of practical work in the field as well didn't he yeah, that's partly because he also set up institutions there and yeah and yeah, yeah absolutely yeah okay yeah um so what everybody said not just that he was he was respected but what a lovely man he was he was just a really nice man yeah, yeah. lovely teacher yeah okay i mean in terms of special needs as you said the language sounds very alien alien to us doesn't it because you've got the um you know, that idea of defectology just makes you shudder when you actually hear the word. And sometimes the way he talks about making children not feel disabled. But do you think he was actually offering a kind of child-centred, inclusive vision of education rather than the sort of hiving off of special needs children you tend to get these days? I don't know if child-centred is the right word, but okay. he, he did believe in meeting the, in meeting the, 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 the child's need. I mean, yes. I just want to go on the language is quite interesting because... I mean, it was just called defectology. I mean, you know, when I started in when I started in, in remedial education, incidentally, and it it, yeah. that's what it was called, and before that, it was called education of subnormal kids, and uh, then special education. It's all the same. I mean, it what matters is how you treat kids, and his his attitude to people mm -hmm. with learning challenges, and what I like to call it, really. Um, yeah is that actually what matters most is the um, attitude of people around them. So if people around them treat them as if they're special and different, then that's not very helpful to them. They see themselves as different. It doesn't, it's no, of no help at all. So it's very, it's important to, to treat them as normal as you can. But it's, I mean, in some cases you treat them in, separately in separate institutions but he didn't believe in institutionalized education for people um mm -hmm. necessarily with for all people with learning challenges i don't think yeah. you know he believed in it, it, people being integrated where they can i mean he was incredibly positive about um about about these students i mean there's a, a really great book that i don't know if anybody well if anybody's interested in reading his work which i do think it's really worth reading is to go on to the um uh, Vygotsky archive on 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 the internet. There's, um, the trouble is, all these books are so expensive. This one called the the fundamentals of defectology. Mm -hmm. There's got all these articles about uh, uh, special educational needs, but a lot of them are on the, are on the internet, and you can find them. So it's it's worth having a, a read. Yeah. Of course, you just referred to education for this because education is self normal, and you know this year is fiftieth anniversary in fact of Bernard Cord's favorite uh, famous mm. pamphlet isn't it on how the education of black students and how black students were labeled as subnormal um, and put into into so-called special schools and that's been a very ongoing fight ever since in fact still a fight around although in a different way around exclusion and so on so I, th I think it's that his ideas on special needs are incredibly um, He's, he writes about inclusion and, and the importance yeah. of inclusion. Actually, it's, it is quite. It is actually. It's, it's a word that he uses in, in in his writing quite a lot, and 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 is important to him, or was important to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've got several comments and questions wow, now. Wow! Wow! <laughs> so um, I'll start with the um, this one um, from Gawain. Uh, totally agree on the importance of concepts and conceptual learning over simply imparting in, in and absorbing knowledge. I think it's the idea of education can't just be top down. Does yeah. this mean that the role of the educator is not simply imparting knowledge or simply facilitating learning, but wor working along child, alongside the child as an expert other? Is that a fair way of describing the relationship and how can we develop that in the classroom? Quite a long comment there, but uh, yeah. I think that's a nice way of looking at it. About the role of the teacher, yeah. But, but not everything has to fall on the teacher, does it? I mean, you know, I, I think you can create classrooms where it isn't just the teacher coming, yeah. uh, coming at it. I think you can create learning environments, co collaborative pools or whatever one wants to think of them as. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that would also be a way of looking at it because the, Vygotsky's notion of the zone of proximal development, he talks about learning... Um, in, in with in with a um, with a in cooperation with a more able peer or adult is what what he's talking mm. about. 
And I think that's quite important to bear in mind. So yeah, but I think that I think really a lot of a lot of what's useful about Vygotsky is a different headset to the, the way edu the way we learn and the way we develop and and to looking at, at at the importance of children thriving in the classroom and as thriving as learners. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we've got loads of comments coming in now, predictably. Um, okay, um, I'll take this one first because it fits with a bit what we're talking. What might Vygotsky have made of E.D. Hershey's idea about a knowledge-rich curriculum God. and the idea of having core knowledge and the, the need for cultural literacy? So, I mean, Hershey's very much at the centre of this knowledge-based curriculum, isn't he? So, um and knowledge is important. I, don't but... know. I mean, Vygotsky wouldn't have gone that far at all. What would he have made of? Um, I mean, it, it's not really talking about about that. So I, I wouldn't have any idea at all. And I don't know. That's not a field that I know. And yeah. um, that's. Yeah. I, I'm sure you know more about that sort of thing than, than I do. Um, uh, but he yeah. did, really didn't write about yeah. that stuff. I mean, he he does write about a curriculum that it mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, developmental but I don't really think he, he writes in terms of I mean I think we can have the political discussion about that but I can't say what Vygotsky would say specifically about yeah that sort of thing I suppose one thing looking at the question is that knowledge rich curriculum it's that idea of who dictates what's in the curriculum isn't it it's um, you know if you think about the current struggle over Black Lives Matter over what is or isn't in the history curriculum you know and the whole whole attack on you know the way that the um, movement around statues, for example, is being seen as an attack on our history. It's perhaps that idea of, you know, I don't, th I don't think any of us would quarrel with the idea of knowledge, but perhaps it's the idea that whose knowledge and defined by who and questioned by who might be. I think he was quite concerned that education should be about the future. In fact, labour he talks about labour yeah. of the country that that kids yeah. should be seen as as the labour future labour of the country. So even when he's talking in terms of being um, having this um, dynamic creative um, curriculum, he's also seeing students as future labour. So I think that that's quite a nice way of putting it. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this bit involves some Russian, and I have no idea how to pronounce it. One word in Russian. Um, from G uh, Jules, can you say something about Perez Zivanie, however you pronounce that? Um, how Vygotsky saw emotion and co cognition not as separated, but in a dynamic relationship within a learning relationship. In other words, what yeah, in, I, I, in a sense, that's what I've just been talking about. About yeah. it's about this importance of of yeah. being. Of engagement and being motivated in in the learning process. That's what it, that, that's my understanding of, of of what he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that if we don't have an emotional engagement in it, and if it is just literally being told this is important by a top down teacher, you're not very likely to perhaps be bothered about it or remember it. Yeah, um, but was, I mean, it's interesting. Whoever said that? There's a whole field that kind. I mean, there's a whole field of. Yeah. Yeah. expertise around that and I'm not part of that <laughs> field right. but I do think it's quite interesting that, he's, that he, he does talk about it in, in that stuff that I do know about. Okay um, some questions which have come up via Twitter um, how did um, quite a few things um, right a question from Twitter would you say Vygotsky advocated the social model of disability as opposed to the medical model um, which I would personally say yes, straight off. No, but I would say both, yeah. because I do think it's terribly, terribly important that yeah. we, do, we do see the two as interlinked. He was very, very good at, under, at having a, a holistic approach. So mm -hmm. yes, he did. In his work, you can see, um, I mean, I, you know, if somebody needs to have medication or whatever it is <laughs> I mean yeah. you, you need to you need to blend the two together you don't say this one or that one and I think a socialist is incredibly important that we don't just say everything is social and everything mm -hmm. because actually we're we we are bodies we are biological entities and that's what he writes about quite mm -hmm. a lot that we are it's the bio mm -hmm. he started off being a bit more biological um mm -hmm. uh you know especially kind of in the sense that kind of Pavlovian the um 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 a behaviorist model is a bit more um sort of medicalized in the stimulus response mm -hmm. sort of thing um yeah. but um 
but then he moves. But I, I don't think he moves completely. He look in in the in the notes that that you can see. You can see he's looking at all the different facets. You know, this mm -hmm. child's got this problem and this problem and that problem, and you know, you look at all of it. Yeah, um, I would, so we just of... don't polarize. I know it's, it's something that it's an argument I often get into with with people on yeah. the left because mm -hmm. I don't think we. I just don't think we can be seen to say everything is social. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like if you're looking at mental health uh, problems, you know, when I was teaching, we had a lot of very hyperactive kids, you know, and I look back now, you know, it's because I stopped being in the classroom a long time ago. I, all these things like really concern me. I, I think, oh my God, I'm sure I'd have done it differently, you know, if I was back there now. But, you know, those hyperactive kids came from very, the schools, school that we worked in, the homes that the, some of the kids came from were really challenging and difficult. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I think they would have benefited from a range of interventions that were both, yeah. you know, possibly yeah. medical or I don't know. Mm -hmm. But then perhaps in terms of a, a social model, it's as much to do with how they're perceived by society. It's to do with inclusion as well, isn't it? So, um, okay, another question. How did Vygotsky relate to the work of Piaget and other educational mm -hmm. psychologists such as Bruno? I mean, Bruno's a lot later, isn't he? But uh, Bruno so, was the one that... Bruno brought his. It was Bruno who talks about sca the notion of scaffolding that um, yeah. Yeah. from his own proximal development. Piaget is quite interesting because um, Vygotsky did sort of set up a. a um, you can see in his writings in in thought and language, particularly that he he's critiquing Piaget and Piaget was a biologist. And we were. It's quite an interesting one to move on to, but B Piaget. <laughs> based a lot of his work on his on his children and he he started off as a swiss but he was a swiss educational psychologist is what he became but he was a biologist um and vygotsky he had some really good ideas about children's development and about conceptual development and vygotsky used a lot of those but the significant thing really about piaget is he doesn't really look at um the, the social he, and he doesn't look at interactions and that sort of thing so and and that's the the main argument that Vygotsky had with Piaget is that it was a non-social model of learning was it this um, and it, uh, Bruno wrote this really interesting um, thing about you know up until Vygotsky we used to think of the, the child as the lone scientist you know mm -hmm. uh, doing things on their own and and uh, you know that's that child-centered thing doing going off and discovery learning but actually Vygotsky changed all that because it was looking at, at, at learning as a, as a social enterprise yeah yeah um one other question related to that I mean Bruno as you said talked quite a lot about scaffolding which sort of builds on the idea of how you support a child and around uh, uh, the idea of the zone of proximal development but somebody has asked well and, you know, zone of proximal development is a phrase you hear quite a lot in education. At the same time, it's been quite depoliticised. Um, so um, and somebody suggested here, Paul, that his work has been divorced from its political underpinnings. Mm. Does that matter? <laughs> or is it yeah, so it's kind of what I was trying to start off with is it's... Yeah. It happens with a lot of good theories, isn't it? They, they take it out of the context and they go, whoa, here's the zone of proximal development. It means just work to the kid's potential and that's it, that's it. But actually what's quintessential to the zone of proximal development is, is a, it's a social theory of learning. It's it's absolutely, you know, it, it, and it's also, a, it's a theory of learning that recognises the, the, the role of, of, of language. So, yes, mm -hmm. it does matter. And it, yes, it's why people shouldn't just pick up on individual ideas. And it's why teacher educators and people in universities that train social workers and all these people around these sorts of things needs to read beyond above and beyond I mean I've seen the stuff that's that's taught to people that's just mundane and it doesn't clock what Vygotsky was getting at that it's a that of the importance of the, of this kind of collaborative um, notion of learning and and how of um, integrating learning it, into the mind Thank you. Okay, a couple of things going back to disability, actually. Um, Roger's making the point the social model doesn't discard a medical thing because impairment is a reality, as I think you said. But the point is the medical approach shouldn't govern how we perceive and understand disability and specifically disability no. oppression. In other words, disability should not be used as an excuse for oppressing people in any way. 
Um, Roger also asked, actually, um, how do we find out more about his approach to use of Braille and sign language? Where can he find out more? So would that that would be on the Vygotsky archive? Um, yes, the, the Vygotsky archive. If you want to buy a book, I'm just going to have a look and see if there's anything. And the, one of the best books, I think, is the uh, is the Vygotsky Reader uh, by Van Der Veer and, and Valsner. Because there's an, uh, yeah, um, and it's got some really nice little examples of of um, a range of of his ideas. So the principles of social education for deaf and dumb children, and in Russia. Mm -hmm. And I just think there's a load of things in in there. So you'd find out more. That's how you'd find out more. I mean, you could actually, how you'd find out more is you'd buy the book that I've just written. <laughs> Which has got a bibliography at the back of it, hasn't yeah. it? And then, and then you go on to that. But, you know, there's yeah. loads of stuff in here. But And there's stuff on, on, on in the yeah. this fundamentals. But these are about 40 to 80 to 100 pounds. It's, it, you know, it's expensive. But you can find them on the internet. There's, if you, But the if you go to the Vygotsky Archive, there are quite a lot of them. On the, and, and there's a lot of articles that people have written using his ideas. but. Um, I always think it's a good idea to go back to the guy himself. Really. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, more comments actually about um, about um, knowledge rich curriculum. Um, Gawain's pointed out the knowledge rich curriculum neglects the role of education as a social process, something that was core to Vygotsky's approach, um, which I think we sort of talked about. A couple here about. Um, how far does education go, if you like, in terms of changing society? Polina says, do you think that Vygotsky believed there could be a revolution in education without a social revolution? OK, and then going back up to bit to Julie, how can we use revolutionary ideas for how we learn to aid a wider resistance to the capitalist system, um, which has not only led to a narrow and restrictive shaping of education for working class kids, but also the horrors we see around us in terms of institutional racism, oppression of women, LGBT people, climate change, poverty, and so on. How can fighting for Gotsky's kind of vision for education in our schools help lead to resistance we need more broadly for a, a different kind of society? So questions about what's the role of education in changing society? Well, I, I think that Vygotsky <laughs> was part yeah. of the revolution and um, he... Um, it was interesting how the revolution actually changed his he, he wasn't a, a revolutionary until there was the revolution and that commitment to the revolution feeds through his work i, I mean it's really that's his starting point is developing a marxist approach and so when he's talking about a curriculum he's talking about a curriculum for a a a, a, a revolutionary country that's he was quite nice very nationalistic he was jewish he didn't want to go and live in israel he wanted to stay in in uh, in in russia and um you know yeah. help help establish the country he was really committed to it so no he didn't believe that you can have um just revolution you know you need the revolution outside and inside because he was also concerned about the lives that people live i mean you did just go into school you have a life outside and he's dealing with a lot of the horrible stuff that happens to people. So I don't think the two are separate at all. And of course, the two are terribly involved when you look at, at um, you know, the, 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 he writes a lot about the wealth of experience that um, that children have, you know, and if you've got a, 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 um, a less enriched background, then you're going to have less ideas and less to draw on to develop develop your ideas further so there is a role for education to i think there's a very strong role for education to 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 recognize the importance of developing a kind of rich learning environment for all their children i mean i think that's absolutely crucial i think all teachers can try to do that uh, and I'm sure you can. I don't know enough about what's happening now, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it's possible to do under the present framework. And but it's certainly important to do. If we want kids to get on, but we need to recognise that that environment can. That if they don't have that wealth, it's they're, they're handicapped in a way. Yeah. On the other hand, there are some people's backgrounds and beliefs, for example, which are consistently downplayed in education, aren't they? Again, the sort of experience of Black Lives Matter and the arguments around decolonising curriculum are not to do with people being deprived. They're to do with slices of history, literature and culture literally being downgraded by our by a system, aren't they? So I think yeah. I think there's that as well. Vygotsky also was presumably an internationalist. He went to London, as you said, on the 
um, to a co conference. Um, I don't know what his association with Trotsky or Trotsky's politics was. He didn't was actually ever meet Trotsky. He was a Trotskyist. Yeah. He, he liked Trotsky's yeah. ideas. He yeah. he was he was extraordinary. He can communicated with people all over the world, but he only ever travelled out of Russia once that we know about, yeah. and that was on, yeah. that visit to London. Um, yeah. But yeah, he communicated. I mean, his wealth of ideas. It, it, Phenomenal, and he was a polymath. I mean, he you know, he was a semiotician. He was a doctor. He was a trained doctor, um, psychologist, psychiatrist, linguist. I mean, just whoa. He, I mean, yeah. very one of very his first works was Psychology of Art, wasn't it? Which was yes, a, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, another question, actually. Um, concepts. Um, we talked a bit about concepts. Can you say a bit more about about both how he sees language as a tool? And how he sort of sees concepts developing. Perhaps talk a bit about egocentric speech as well. So, uh... yeah. So I was saying to you that there's different sorts of concepts. I mean, the, when if you're looking at so these, this is more every day. This is a shape. So this, well, there's lots of con yeah. There are lots of concepts in here. So this is a size, isn't it? A concept mm -hmm. of size, and color and those that's kind of everyday concepts that you just learn every yeah sorry, sorry. um so there's, there's that notion um but there's kind of uh, you know, the, the concepts that we want to, to use in education are more abstract concepts aren't they so um and and that's the scientific concept that, that we're thinking about so um um so, I mean, I just think, you know, in a sense, I don't know how people teach these days. But it, when I when I stopped training people, that you kind of used to tell, used to be quite clear about the sort of what you wanted to get out of a lesson, and people used to kind of choose the the key concepts. I used to get my students to choose the key concepts that they wanted to get across in the lesson, and which is quite interesting when you start thinking about what is what are the concepts I'm trying to get across here. Mm -hmm. Because you know, and then you can think about the. I can't remember what the question was. You can think about um, the range of concepts, but you see, I, I also think what he talks about is how you learn concepts. Is that they, that it, you don't just learn the full concepts. When you learn concepts, you learn them gradually. Mm. So as we're in the process of learning, we, we, I always remember kind of when I was doing the MA. Actually, there was somebody on our course who's now very academic about Vygotsky, but he used to play around with Vygotsky's ideas. It, but and he hadn't fully understood them, but you know, but but and it's what Vygotsky would have called it was at a pseudo level of understanding. But you, you, mm -hmm. it takes you a while to get the, the the depth, the real level of understanding of of the concept. And once you've got that concept, it can take you on to understanding others. So you learn it through talking, and you learn it through um, in, uh, interaction. And so he talks about kind of um, he talks about inner speech that. You know, there's that thing about inner speech is um, that we think in the, the language we think in. When the, when the kids were playing with the Vygotsky blocks, they were they were verbalizing their inner their inner speech when they were talking about what made them decide what was what was what and what what was that. What, what was that. So inner speech and that that time to reflect is in, in, important in terms of developing the concept. Of course, one thing is that whole idea about egocentric speech, isn't it? That as children are developing, yeah. in fact, we do it as adults as well, they actually talk it through out loud, and that actually helps them to actually sort of come up to a more more complex com concept, if you like, and to actually start internalising the idea. And I think that's very powerful. And of course, we all do it when we're, when we're trying to work something out, don't we? I mean, I, think I mean, that's, I mean, that's that thing, so. it's the one thing yeah. that we all. I, I always think it's it, to understand yeah. what egocentric. Piaget mm -hmm. talked about egocentric speech as stopping at the age of seven. Yeah. Vygotsky didn't say that, or he might have done at one point. I mean, the, the difficulty about mm -hmm. saying somebody said that, it's like with Marx, they've changed their ideas. But yeah. um, um, egocentric speech is a wonderful way of thinking through stuff. You know, that, that, that when you talk to yourself, when you're, well, I talk to myself in the bath or talk to myself in the car mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and you think through stuff. And it's a, it's, um, it's a way mm -hmm. of, of, of beginning... Mm -hmm. uh, coming to yeah. terms with or developing yeah. the ideas yeah and of course it also relates to the fact that he sees concepts developing from what he calls i think um complexes to pseudo concepts to what he then defines as scientific concepts mm. and he also actually there's an argument certainly john parrington's recent book suggests 
um, that um, students, you know, teenagers are still not totally mature in their way of scientific thinking. I don't know what people think about that. Um, yeah, Vygotsky, uh, people say yeah. that Vygotsky yeah. said, I, I actually have a problem with it because I yeah. always used to think kind of, you can't generalize some some scientific concepts. I don't, see Bruna says you can understand a lot of things you, mm -hmm. you know, from the age of six, but you have a more complex understanding, you know, space yeah. technology sort of, or the notion of space and all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I do know that my kids, used to tell me that their teachers were sexist because they'd keep the the boys in the classroom when they were at the age of eight or six or something. And I, <laughs> Not a fully I, developed concept. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, God, is that, uh, you know, yeah. I, mean, I think you've got the concept of, uh, of, yeah. of sexism there. So <laughs> yeah. I was just yeah. doing all this stuff at the time. It was quite interesting, actually. Okay. No, I don't, think, I don't think we can be black and white. And I think, you know, it's when you're black and white about it that you bump into the, uh, a problem, actually, because it, it, learning isn't or isn't all black and white. And the trouble is the government wants it to be, but it's not. It's not. And it's not measurable. And it's not, you know, it's not levels. And it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're coming to sort of the end. We've only got about five minutes left. So any last minute questions or comments from um, the audience? Um Put, put them in now and we'll try and try and discuss them um and so on but i think that i mean that covers not, i think one thing about vygotsky is he's so incre incredibly rich in what he says that you can kind of go back and back to it and um and then you learn something new every time so um unless anybody's got any last minute questions comments or whatever um i'll just hand back to you shirley to say how do you see um vygotsky's work and the inspiration it's given developing in the future. So I was smacking that. I think one of the things I want to say before that um, is I think one of the things that is so exciting is this thing about um, when he started out, Vygotsky talked about he wanted to develop a Marxist um, psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, and the whole of what we see is is really a mark, and I think that's what people need to understand it, it, that it is within a, that that frame that he that he was thinking about back in when he was a young man in the twenties, um, and it, it is a Marxist psychology, and it, it I think what's brilliant is that it shows that thinking in that way is productive and pr and w produces kind of good teachers or people who work with other people. I I know that as a you know, I've been a mental health carer and I used to kind of think, well, why on earth can't these people realise that they could do this, that and the other? And I know that I think my kind of lack of understanding of why the system wasn't working right is because people haven't been trained in that sort of way, is that it didn't clock about the the, the, the impact of, um, uh, of of what we do, our language, so all those different factors that 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 created that came out of um, that commitment to, to Marxism, and I think, you know, that that's to me incredibly important about um, Vygotsky's work. Where are we going in the future? I mean, I I just I just think that it's it would be really good if we could get Vygotsky into courses in. Um, in universities, I would like to see this book in every university um, bookshop in in the land. Really, I think people need to be trained in in these ideas. That's that's what I would like to to see, so people understand um, how how children or how they. I mean, it helps you to under my my students used to say it changed their lives. So, you know, it, it can it can really um, it, have an impact. So, I I hope that. Um, I hope that there's more access to his ideas, and that it's not just his ideas taken out of concept, uh, out of context. That it, that, it, that that we're in the context of of understanding that it's for a better world and for um, developing children who are who have the resources to to learn and and lead rich lives. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I think also so much teacher training goes on in schools these days rather than at universities, and I think that's one of those aspects that. Mm often miss out on schools don't actually promote that kind of theoretical um understand underpinning if you like of ideas um and i think that's something important um okay just a couple of things before we go i meant to say at the start and i completely forgot um shirley did ask me to say she actually had a major operation um 
a week <laughs> ago. Um, in fact, a few days ago, and was certainly in quite a lot of pain um, earlier on in the week. So I'm really, really grateful that she was able to do that. And I'm sorry, I forgot to apologise for that at the start. Also, a um, request from Gary in Swansea, can you do meetings on Vygotsky and promote the book? So I'll um, hand that over. Um, and also bookmarks. Obviously, you can, you can order Shirley's new book, which will be out soon. Um, and also there's quite a lot of other uh, stuff around on Vygotsky. We've talked about the Vygotsky archive, the Vygotsky reader and John Parrington's mind shift are both available from bookmarks. You can also get Vygotsky's writing, thought and language and mind in society are both, you know, possibly the sort of starter books, um, which I think are brilliant. So thank you to everybody for coming and for your comments. I hope um, we managed to pick up on most of them and that the discussion goes on. So thank you to everybody for coming. Okay. So.